we're good. Good evening from this great state of Missouri. We are so happy to have people from all over the United States being a part of our presidential panel for 2020. We have many people to thank. First of all, you can see the logo for Heart Zones. Heart Zones is one of our promotional partners and we thank them for bringing uh, this to you tonight. I also want to make sure that we thank Guy Danhoff for his incredible uh, work that he does for us on a daily basis, and we'll talk about him a little bit later. You can see these four wonderful photos that we have here, and as one of them, we won't uh, mention who, suggested that this, instead of being Mount Rushmore, this might be Mo Rushmore. And so this is something that we will keep with us forever. You'll notice that uh, I am a little bit more dressed than most people. I'm home, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. But as we were preparing for this, I flash back to my very first national convention, well before most of you were born, March of 1965 in Chicago. I was in my third year of teaching in Southern Wisconsin, and I had one purpose in attending the National Convention. It was not just to interact with others and to learn a lot that I could use in my professional work, but my sole purpose was to meet the president of AFERD. His name was Reuben Frost, known to others as Jack Frost. He was the president of Springfield College in Massachusetts. We happened to graduate from the same undergraduate institution in Northern Iowa, Luther College. And two of his daughters were team members of mine on the uh, student newspaper at the college. And as soon as I had an opportunity, I walked up and I introduced myself and we started a wonderful conversation. And for years, we had dinner at every national convention following that. So from that beginning, I would be so proud to share with all of our members, these outstanding people who are leading our national society. And this is your opportunity to become a, uh, acquainted with those who selflessly give of their time and their effort and their expertise to move the Society of Health and Physical Educators America forward. We are proud to partner with these people and we're proud of the fact that they have been very active in attending our hashtag Zagging 101 sessions, other town hall meetings, and one of them happened to get a tattoo on a snowy day here in St. Louis. And so we're just very happy to bring back Jody Lobianco. If, if you don't know much about Jody, you give her a guitar and all of a sudden there's going to be a little song fest and it's going to be exciting. And when she's playing the guitar and making some outstanding music, Jamie gets up and starts to dance. <laughs> So we, we have a lot of great, wonderful connections with these people. Brett Fuller, I've known for a number of years, not as long as I want to, but with my Wisconsin background, he and I hit it off very well. And Terry, I enjoyed working with you on, on a society task force. And we know that you are gonna lead our society forward for years to come. You know, we don't have to mention, we have a number of people in our profession who could go by one name, just like Bono and Cher and uh, Madonna and others. Ours is Guy. Guy affects everything we do on a daily basis. He not only affects what we do, but he spoke last week with the Minnesota people and had some of us be a part of that. Guy Danhoff is our Director of Digital Media and Promotions, and he also works very closely with Shape America on their strategic planning team and media. So Guy, we're just very, very proud to have you as a part of our organization. You and I go back a number of years and we've had fabulous meetings in your office at the 
break company at uh, Starbucks. And as we talked about earlier today, next week we're ready to pivot. We're looking at what we've done. And folks, that's not nearly enough. Guy and I are not happy until we revolutionize what is going on. So Guy, you can't imagine how much appreciation we have for you and your work. And today's session is gonna be moderated by two other outstanding Missouri members. Anna Forchelito has been teaching in the Rockwood School District. She has been involved with our SEAL Team 6, which has been involved with promotions and social media. She, along with Jody Lease, are the two candidates for Missouri, uh, or for the most shaped president-elect. Make sure you vote, Missouri members. Jamie and Judy and Brett and Terry, I'm sorry, you can't vote on this, but uh, Anna and Jody, the uh, ballot will be finished by Saturday at noon. And I'm very happy to have Anna be a part of our team. Just very exciting. We enjoy everything that we do. The other moderator is a person that I didn't know until the Nashville convention. And at the Central District uh, Award Ceremony and meeting, I was sitting at my table and two young people came up. They're, everybody's young to this old guy. <laughs> but they came and sat next to me. And I recognized uh, Brett, Brad Brummel because uh, he had attended a session at a convention. I didn't know Sean, but it took about two seconds to realize the incredible attributes that he has and the ability to lead and to join in. And Brad has, uh, is going to join our board of directors as a, a committee chair for member services. Sean has been on our board of directors. He was the Missouri director of health and physical education for our Department of Education. And then somebody by the name of Stephanie Morris said, Sean, come and work for us. <laughs> and so through a CDC grant, uh, Sean has been working with Shape America. And I'm proud to say that he continues to be a member. He and I had a wonderful conversation again at uh, Starbucks a week or so ago. You can never have enough of this young man. So again, I just want to uh, turn it over to you. And Sean, you can describe the format that we're going to follow tonight. And one last thing. Normally, I could have on sweats or I could have uh, a casual shirt or something. Folks, you are all important to me. Your work is very critically important to what I've based my life on. And I did this just to show my respect for who you are as professionals and for the work that you do. And for the four presidents, we could not be more thrilled that you are with us tonight. So thank you. I'll wrap things up later on, but Sean, it's all yours, my friend. Thank you, Tom. That, you know, every time I hear you, just, it, it means so much. So thank you, and I'm glad to be a part of this. Yes, this is Sean Nevels from the great state of Missouri. And along with Anna Force Lido, we are here to moderate tonight's Shape America presidential panel discussion. Before we get started, I'll cover a few rules of engagement to set the stage and guide tonight's events. Prior to this session, our MoShape team created a series of questions for the panel. Most questions will be directed towards a particular member of the panel, so panel, Please listen for your name to be called for each question. There are also a few questions in the series that are open to the entire group. So if you have a response, please be quick. Lastly, this panel offers a robust level of experience, knowledge, and expertise. So out of respect to the group, please keep all responses no longer than four minutes, give or take a few seconds. To our panel, to our Shape America presidents, past, current, and future, thank you. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. I really appreciate that. And I'm so excited and honored to be here tonight. This is, this is a amazing, epic night. So thank you so much. Uh, Guy, I'm going to go straight to you. And to kick you off, I have to give some, hey, Moshe Chip America members. Here we go for Shape Press, Shape Press 2020. All right, Guy, to you. Why now? How did the need of this session 
come to fruition and why now? Well, it's a great question, Anna. And you know, the truth of the matter is, and Tom kind of, you know, alluded to this, the bottom line is, and I learned this from Stephanie Morris, and I've learned this from our four presidents from spending time with each of them, is that right now in COVID, we're seeing yet another pivot and change. We saw what happened in the spring when we were all sent home, and that was an experience in the summer. You know, we were going to keep speculating, what's it going to be like? We we're getting all these resources together. And we were able to do some things to help our state, you know, uh, give back. And, and one of those things was Chalk Your Walk. Uh, in many ways, the Chalk Your Walk event for us was very pivotal because what it allowed us to do was to spread kindness and positivity at a time when we were all in different places. You know, we weren't feeling great. The, the uncertainty uh, and, and just the, the, the stress and the pressure and the anxiety. Well, we decided to spread kindness. And what that taught us is that in that two day event, um, and I got to say this, you know, Jamie Sparks, when we asked him to share this on the Pedal Pep Talk, I mean, the next thing you know, what started as a statewide, you know, event went totally viral. And in the HPE community, we reached 44 states in three countries. And the most important guys, if you're, if you're from Missouri, the most important thing it did for us is at that moment, it changed everything for us because we stopped being just focused on our convention in November. Now we're meeting and serving the needs of our members literally every single week. And that's why you've seen so much content come out from, from us over the last eight, eight uh, I'm sorry, ever since the past seven months, really. It's been a steady stream. And so why are we here? Well, because our state, as well as a few other states, as well as Shape America, we've had some great successes with social media. And that's been great. But when COVID hit, uh, it, it really left a void for people. And we just took advantage of the void. And we were able to, to create some content like a Spaker Spot, you know, serving the needs of Suck at Home Recess. And, 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 and also with Suck at Home Snacks that was all funded through uh, a CDC grant that was you know, given to Laura Beckman and Missouri Healthy Schools that we got to be part of. And we've had some amazing team people like Patrick Fine and Brad Rummel and Sally Schulte and some others put together some outstanding teacher resources. Whether you're teaching face-to-face, -face, hybrid, or even in the virtual environment. And so we're here today simply because guys, social media consumption is changing. You're gonna hear about that tonight. I gave a report to our board of directors this past Monday, and there were some outstanding things about the report, and there's some other things that are alarming. And we wanna dive into that. And we felt seriously, the best way to do that, well, let's not just look at me or Tom or Dennis. Let's bring in, as you guys call what, Mo Rushmore. Let's bring in the presidents of Mo Rushmore. So that is why we're here today and why we're here now for this special town hall. Absolutely, thank you, it's awesome. Thank you, Guy. Question number two is mine, and it goes to the Judy Lobianco. Judy brought her uh, Jersey brand of advocacy to, to the Shape America presidency, and I can tell you from my own experience that nothing was more special than the 2019 convention when she was on stage just dancing her butt off in Tampa. So, Judy, this question is yours. On, on the message of advocacy, how has communication evolved? How has communicating advocacy evolved since you became Shape president? Thank you, Sean, and thank you, Mo Shape. I thank you so much for giving me this 45 minutes to answer this question. I, uh, I want to tell you that the phrase I keep thinking about is, if I only knew then what it is we know now. In 2018, and this is March of 2018 when I took the presidency, we had decided to make an intentional and thoughtful attempt at advancing the way we delivered our advocacy messaging, right? Up till then, we were engaging in email, in-person meetings, printed newsletters, and there was an intentional pivot all along to say, look, you know, maybe we have to start to embrace the entire profession and inclusive of our membership, be able to send a message that would resonate. And advocacy is communication, right? And so it became this slow move toward advocacy being something that Shape America was telling people about to what we see now, which is each and every individual teacher and program telling their actual story. Because in the end, that's what advocacy really is. And, and I think the evolution 
you can't even call it that. It's been so fast, I can't get over it. Um, we're at a point now after all these years where, you know, the stage is open and the curtain is up and we are all out there being able to tell our story and that, that the story starts with children. So uh, I think the evolution has to do with the fact that we've embraced advocacy as a form of communication and it's up to us to put our best foot forward each time. Thank you. Love it. Love it, Judy. Well, we're going to shift and pivot over to Jamie for our next question. And speaking of advocacy, Jamie, something you just discussed is talking about how advocacy is constant. It's every single day. And your message was redefining the community during your presidency. So how did you amplify your message of redefining your community using social media and beyond? Thanks, Anna. And uh, as Judy said, it's good to be with everybody tonight. Um, you know, one of the things I found most effective around that message was, uh, as most of people remember in the Ozarks last year, uh, falling on stage. It's very effective for capturing people's attention. And so um, that seat drop uh, down in the, uh, the Ozarks was, was very effective at redefining our community because people remember that. And uh, what people in Missouri don't know, uh, later on that year, I made a number of state trips last year. I was in California. Uh, in February, and uh, I had flashbacks of Missouri, and so I said, all right, I'm not going to jump up on stage. I'm going to go the smart route and calm down and go up the steps, and so I managed to trip going up the steps in California, so whether I jump on the stage or go up the steps, either way, uh, lasting impression, but uh, in all seriousness, uh, the, the whole message around redefine our community um, was, was making that connection with Health and PE, and is that opportunity um, to, to share the importance of health and PE and how we're making progress. ESSA is a step forward and a lot of people are still trying to connect into what that means as it re relates to federal funds, but we're, we're in the ball game. And I will say that COVID, despite how awful it's been and still continuing to wreak havoc, um, it's doing something that, that, cause rock redefine our community is also that metaphor about how we're trying to change education. And what we have before us right now is a moment in time that we will never, ever have again in health and be. For the first time in two decades last spring, we threw out standardized tests. That is the number one thing that's been holding us back for far too long because that's how we want to measure schools. So coming up again this year, what we can probably expect potentially, at least more so maybe from the Biden administration, is maybe a second year of federal waivers on testing. So it's a huge shift around reimagined education health and PE teachers around this country, we have to be ready for this moment. Because ESSA helped change the conversation, but it didn't fundamentally change a lot of the things we were doing to measure schools. Now, when we see what schools are doing, our community is forever being redefined. And we have to be ready to respond to that. And thank goodness that we have Carly Wright and Sean and Stephanie and others at Shape America to lead and guide us through those conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jamie. And just, you know, to that point, a quick plug for the podcast that just dropped today with Carly Wright and Karen Johnson to talk about advocacy and potential, you know, for sure, why is that a matter post-election with a change in administration? So please make sure you check that out. But we're going to current president, Brett Fuller. President Fuller, you came in during a, a, just an amazing time in our world with this pandemic and everything. So, and, you know, advocacy was your foundation, but the message is stronger together. Why is that message so important during this pandemic? Thank you, Sean. And again, I also want to echo that what the other presidents have said here. Thank you, Moshe, for inviting us all here. This is a great opportunity. And I think that's the point of the whole message. It is, this is our opportunity in health and physical education. You know, the, the message of stronger together came together kind of organically. I was going back and forth, what's my theme going to be? Uh, and then all of a sudden COVID hit and it was amazing. You know, I've been in this job for, you know, as, a, as an educator for 30 years now, and I've seen a lot of teachers who are very protective of what they create and they don't always want to share. And it was amazing to see what happened last spring. Everybody started sharing what was working and it, and it really was that epitome of stronger together, but it's more than just that is when they started working together and started talking and sharing across districts, across the states and across the country, we really are more of a community now than we've ever been before. And that is, and that message needs to keep on carrying forward because 
this is our opportunity, as Jamie, as Jamie mentioned here. We are necessary. We are necessary for the health of our kids. I've told my teachers in Milwaukee Public Schools that I believe that they save lives. And I, and I know that we save lives as health and physical educators. And now it's our opportunity to let the world understand that, that we are, that we are vitally important to the future of our kids, not because we're going to change test scores, not because we're uh, better for academics, even though those are important things that, and it help get, helps us get money, but just because of the work that we do around social emotional learning, around physical and health, health, mental health, overall wellness. And that's why it's important to keep on working together, stronger together, keep sharing like we've been doing and, and coming together as a group, and then really be that unified voice. And Shape America can be the uh, megaphone for that unified voice of all of the physical education health teachers in this country. Thank you, President Fuller. Stronger together, but you said it, changing lives. And that's what we're in the business of doing as health and physical educators. All right, shifting to current, or excuse me, President-elect Terry Drain. This one is for you, kind of staying in the realm of a pandemic and everything. Um, how can teachers incorporate advocacy into their daily practice? Right. Uh, that's a great question. Before I, I answer, I, I, again, I want to thank Mo Shape for this opportunity. Tom, thanks for that wonderful introduction. Guy and, and your team, thank you for all you're doing to improve our social media literacy. I know I've learned a lot. I so, I so appreciate that. I believe our most powerful advocacy tool is the quality of instruction that we provide. So what can teachers do? They can bring their A game every single day. They need to provide learning experiences where students feel safe, supported, learning experiences that are educative, and meaningful and engaging for every single student. Physical education should be our students' favorite time of the day. It should be something they look forward to. Our students of today are the decision makers of tomorrow. And just imagine where we would be right now if our parents, our administrators, our politicians all look back fondly on their physical education and health experience as one that was life-changing. So that's where we start. And we also use our, our, our experiences and our interactions with students to educate them about physical literacy and health literacy and how this is our why, this is the foundation of what we do and guides everything that is done in health and physical education. We also use this opportunity to edu uh, educate our parents and our administrators by inviting them into our class and sharing what we do. So this is a good start for what we can do to incorporate advocacy into our daily practice. Um, in terms of the, the um, COVID epidemic, this is a fabulous opportunity for us. There's such a focus on social emotional competencies. We should be teaching this. It is our content. And it's such an opportunity for us to point this out that being, having the social emotional competency is part of what being physical literacy, literate and health literate. And that we are the only two subjects that have standards related to these competencies. So it is such an opportunity for us and um, it's definitely one that uh, we can certainly be taking advantage of. Thank you. Man, Terry, I have to tell you, I love that so much. Our students today are decision makers of tomorrow. I, I love it. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was amazing. Uh, I wanna shift back to Guy here for our next question is, as we go into some of our data and analytics, and he is our data and analytic guru, as we love Guy for that reason, and so many others. But guys, speaking of our data analytics, we're gonna shift gears towards our, oh, I, I skipped a question. I apologize about that. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. We're gonna talk, still talking about data though. Uh, we wanna discuss the role of social listening, which you are phenomenal at. I've learned so much from you and how evaluating the data analytics has provided MoShape with a unique opportunity for advocacy within our HP profession, as well as the use of micro-influencers. So Anna, that, that's a great question. And anyone who's ever attended any of the 12 zagging episodes, I probably say this every single week, I'm gonna say it again. And, 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 and I say this because I know the power of the results and this, and it's here, it's, it's this quote. You cannot manage what you do not measure. That is why it's so critically important that we measure our social media analytics, our website analytics, 
uh, our, our click-through rate analytics, whatever analytics we have, especially in social media, it's going to tell you so much. It is like Tom was talking about. This is how we're doing our pivot. We saw some drastic changes since school began after Labor Day based on what was happening in the spring, based on what was happening in the summer. And then now what's going on right now as we you know, get into the winter months. So that analytics is a, is a real big piece. And as far as social listening goes, guys, as I've said all the time, if there's nothing else you do as a state to begin with, it, and, and or if you're a teacher or if you're an administrator, all I can say is you want to start just to listen to the conversations that are going on. And, and I don't know, I, I, I use a tool called Hootsuite. We talked about that. Basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a tool that allows you to have up to basically 10 different uh, uh, platforms to listen. And what's so great about the listening is I can follow people. I can follow influencers. I can follow organizations. I can follow news. And my favorite is following hashtags. I love following the hashtags because I want to be able to see what is the conversation, what's being said, and then more importantly, if there's a way for us as MoShape, or even sometimes Shape America, if there's a play for us, what do we want to say and how do we want to say it? So that's why um, that's so critically important. And then the last thing is this, is the, what we call the social influence or the micro influencers. And all I can say is in all my doctoral work, you including the textbook I wrote, if someone were to tell me, you know, what was one thing that you could do like tonight? What is one thing I could do? I can tell you, tell you this. If you want to see your social media blow up to two, three, four, even 10 times on those key performing metrics known as KPIs, if you want to see that blow up, start using micro influencers. In our case, where Chalk the Walk went from just our state only, we got Jamie involved. Jamie got the board of directors involved and then the whole national board at Shape America. And we weren't asking them to vote on anything. We were just saying as people, hey, do you want to you know, embrace this? And guess what? They did. And because of that, Jamie's influence, they got everyone in Shape America, that whole board to participate. Next thing you know, we noticed two days later, we're in 44 states and three countries. Yes. Guys, that is the role of the micro-influencer. Why do you think last year when we knew that we needed a fundraising tool. We needed something to address SCL in the schools. We needed something to bring the WISC model. And that tool was Health Moves Minds. That's why we brought Jamie in. The guy believed so much in it, the guy was willing to get some tattoos. Yeah, he's got tattoos, he's looking for a third. But what's my point in saying this? Is because he was a big time influencer. He came in and everything he did, we streamed. We wanted everyone to know whether you're in Missouri or wherever you were. Why? Because this program was so new. And all I can say is, guys, if you, if you want to really know how you can make things move faster, I'm going to leave you with one last story. This is for those in Missouri. I find it really interesting that I've been talking about using micro-influencers for 12 consecutive weeks on Zagging 101. Just two weeks ago, the St. Louis Dispatch announced that Governor Parson himself has struggled mightily with trying to get people to adhere to all these guidelines going on with um, you know, COVID prevention, right? So what has he decided to do? Now he's gonna be using micro-influence in Missouri, people like Ozzie Smith. You're gonna be seeing this coming out in a few weeks. And now guess what he's doing? He's doing this to launch his state's COVID prevention plan. He's using the influencers, why? Because they move the needle, they move the metrics, they push the algorithms, and that's how you get your message heard faster and, and, and better. So with that, uh, you guys know I say this almost every week on every show, but it is true. You got to be doing the triple D, data drives decisions. You got to be social listening, got to jump in, know when to jump in conversations. And lastly, leverage your social media influencers. And we got a lot right now in this panel. We have a lot right now, actually, that are on this town hall right now. So with that, Anna, thank you for the question. You're welcome. Thank you for that. That was an amazing answer. Amazing. So we're going to give God that pass for going a couple seconds over. <laughs> but, you know, stand on that topic of social listening and the data analytics. Um, but this question is going to the field. So once again, uh, quick response, and we can take one or two responses here. Um, particularly for your state, how has, you know, how, how has evaluating the data analytics helped you advocate for your state and find those micro-influencers? 
I'll jump in first, Sean, and say, you know, I actually, I'll give Guy a lot of credit on this because I met Guy too, uh, in Nashville at the National Convention my year as president-elect, and I told him then um, I, I've just organically started using social media, and I, and I didn't really have a lot of strategy. I um, do a lot of our social media for our state as well, as well as my personal, and uh, I knew the impact of it, and really my, the, the, my, my organic belief in it was simply around my, my love and passion for advocacy. And what I realized a number of years ago is that oftentimes emails, legislators and superintendents, they get a lot of emails. But when you could connect with them and tag them on social media and via Twitter, um, that they're carrying that around in their pocket. And so the, the opportunities and to see other leaders and influencers listening on social media. I remember the first time our commissioner of education had one of our members step to the mic and he said, I know you're with Kentucky Shape and I know you're going to talk to me about the importance of a well-rounded education. Before they ever spoke a word, our commissioner of education knew what they were going to say. So that power and influence and then to, to gain strategies through it, I think that's what guys brought all of our state associations is, is understanding the analytics, understanding how to be more effective. And, um, you know, just, just tonight, just for a real life, um, test case, I looked at our campaign that we're doing this week, Kindness Across the Commonwealth. Uh, about four hours ago, we were approaching 650,000 impressions and 80,000 uh, in reach. I reached out and I looked at our analytics. We use Keyhole for our analytics. Looked at that and I seen Mimi Ratliff, Daniel Hill, and Candace Young were our top three influencers. I sent them a message that said, I'm about to tag you in something. Retweet it, like it, and uh, reply to it. Our, we immediately shot up within two, three hours, another 120,000 impressions and another 10,000 in reach. And that's another thing that we've done with our board is we constantly hold our board members responsible and accountable. When we have a campaign going on, we, our leadership starts with Robin. It started with Daniel Hill. We hold each other accountable because those are very easy actions that we can all do regardless my board members are probably laughing at me because I geek out on the analytics. I like looking at the data and looking at the stuff, but what we know is people are listening and we want that message to be out there. And, and as I said in the chat a second ago, even more so now that we've rebranded ourselves Kentucky shape, we have a great tagline that's resonating with people teaching students to thrive for life. So the more we can put that message out and it resonates, that builds the brand of the, the power and the influence of health and PE. And that, that all of that comes through social media. Thank you, Jamie. And the one big thing you said there was accountability, that everybody in your state is holding each other accountable to spread that message that we need. So that's, that's perfect right there. We'll go on to the next qu question. Anna, it's all yours. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much. And we're going to bring in the topic of our future professionals and young professionals right now because they're so critical to the future of our profession. And they're it, it's, it's really a, it's a hot topic right now as well. So speaking, this is question goes out to everybody tonight. Um, speaking of the data analytics and something we learned so much with, we're going to, it's during a recent episode of Zagging 101, it was discussed that 67% of Instagram users are between the ages of 18 and 30 and 29 years old. And so my question is, does SHAPE and or your state associations have a plan to engage them, especially on Instagram with your social media advocacy efforts? And I'll jump in real quick for Shape America. Yes, right now, Shape America does actually uh, use Instagram and a couple other platforms for social media. Uh, with this in mind, of course, part of that is because, uh, you know, they, we also look at the analytics. And so this is really important. This is the future. Uh, the future of our association are these young, these young professionals. And so we, we absolutely are involved in that. But uh, I'll let others talk about the states. Thank you, Brett. Yeah, here in New Jersey, we have only just recently woken up to the fact that we've got to leverage the power of Instagram to be able to talk to these young professionals. And it's interesting to me, you know, we've only started to connect our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter pages so that we can cross post and make sure that we go out to find them because they're not always coming to find us, right? We're starting the power of Twitter chats. Just last night, New Jersey Aford hosted a chat for future professionals that I don't think has been done in a while. And that was to bring together some supervisors from across the country, because that's the beauty of social media. Me and a couple of my favorite buddies over the, over the course of uh, just an hour, being able to help future professionals with their interviews and their resumes. We've got to help them where they are. We've got to be able to interest them where their interests are. 
um, particularly in their first year and their senior years and as undergrads. We've got to be able to say, look, your way of life has got to be able to have a growth mindset and we can help you with that network if you just reach out to your state, reach out to Shape America, become a member, become engaged and uh, you know, continue to, to reach out to them and go find these young professionals and let them know that although it's always been a tradition to be a member of a professional organization, particularly now, you have to reach out. You have to be able to be connected because if you don't, you can't survive in education anymore. There's just no way that a new teacher can come into this environment and survive without having a growth mindset. And these organizations provide that. Yeah, absolutely. Does, is there anyone else that like, do, Judy, thank you so much for sharing that because you're, you could not be more spot on. Is there anyone else that we would like to Yeah. So, so Anna, I'm just going to say this, um, and I'm not going to give away our strategy, obviously, because <laughs> only because um, I know for a fact that our incoming president, um, you know, Dr. Patrick Fine, I know that is, that is definitely on his agenda. I've spoken to him. Uh, Tom Lowry and I were on a, on a, on a town hall just, like a, just a few months ago, and we actually had a fantastic engagement with our future professionals. And I also know, Anna, from interviewing both you and our other candidate, you know, Jody Lees, that that's also on your minds. And uh, this is going to be a great thing for our state. I know we're going to double down on for the same reasons that Judy just spoke about, that we got to get them engaged now, and this is the time. And so I, all I can say to, you know, obviously to the Missouri folks, guys, you're going to see a lot more happening with our future professionals, literally like never before, simply because we've got to get them uh, really engaged. But the cool part is with things like Instagram, they can actually have a lot of fun engaging with it and actually helping us tell our story even better. So I'm really looking forward to it. And with that, I'm not going to steal any more of Patrick's thunder or even our president-elect's uh, candidate speeches. So with that, is there anyone else that'd like to answer the question? All right, collective pause. I think we will keep it moving. Thank you so much, Guy. All right, president-elect Terry Drain, back to you. You said two phrases that absolutely always spark my love for what we do, and that's health literacy and physical literacy. Especially during this time, you know, this COVID-19 time, when we're talking about developing, you know, the, the whole school, whole community, whole child, right? So, you know, what social media strategies would you use to advocate for health literacy and physical literacy? Yeah, well, another great question. Uh, I firmly believe that health literacy and physical literacy provide us with the ultimate justification for why health and physical education belong in the school curriculum. So we have an incredibly powerful why, and we need to get it out there. And personally, when I am using social media, I'm very intentional with how I use it. My two goals are, first of all, to help elevate the profession, and secondly, to help support teachers, to empower them to speak with confidence about health literacy and physical literacy and how they benefit children. So when I'm tweeting content or retweeting content, I'm always asking myself, how, how does this support the teaching and learning of health education and physical education? So I'm looking for content that does that. I'm also work to create content that will support teachers in, in this endeavor. And some of you may have seen some of the work I've done. I uh, wrote something called the Who Am I Chant a while back, uh, which gives the teachers the language to use to advocate for physical literacy and what they do. And uh, more recently, this last summer, I created, uh, I did a, a presentation for the elementary PE workshop called Unleash the Power of Our Why. And I'll stick the links to, for, to these two um, efforts in the chat box so you can check them out later. Um, but I think our teachers need some support and um, to become strong advocates for the profession, especially now, because we're about to head into some choppy waters if we aren't already there uh, with budget cuts and whatnot, and we need to make sure everybody understands the value of what we do. So that, that is what I would do. Uh, yeah, and you know, and I just wanna add on, we've been talking about data analytics. I have a lot to learn, and I, uh, I probably didn't know what I didn't know until I started going into Zagging 101. Um, but you know, here's one effort that I would really like to know more information about. Some of you might remember last June that the Portland Public Schools were threatening to cut uh, make significant cuts to their elementary PE program. 
and um, they they hit that full on. And Adam Howell from Phys Edagogy reached out to their 25,000 supporters and asked them to contact um, school board members. And um, so the analytics I'd love to know is like how many of them acted on that. And I know a lot of people on this this call right now, Kim Ballard for one, uh, Judy, they were tweeting. Uh, messages to school board members and obviously it was super effective because at that school board meeting they voted not to make those cuts so um, there's a, a great example of the power of social media that uh, we can definitely learn from and, and use to our own advantage thank you president like drain and yeah hopefully you know after the recording of this if there is some time you know we can maybe hopefully share some some of those data analytics you talk about but one thing i do want to touch on that you did mention is the need to pay attention, especially when we're talking about budget cuts, not this year, but for the 21-22 school year. And that's when we really need to pay, be, be on the lookout and amp up our advocacy efforts. Thank you so much. Anna, back to you. Thank you, Sean. And I'm actually gonna circle back to our future professionals and young professionals, because we need to open this up. Something we like to do in Zagging 101 is we have been known to give away some heart zone watches and we have one to give out to everybody tonight if they can answer the question correctly the first person that answers the question correctly in the chat box will receive a heart zone watches they have been so generous in um, giving away free watches for as as a promo so thank you so much heart zones for what you do and for being part of our most shaped community so the question is for all of you <laughs> goes back to how teachers can incorporate advocacy into their daily practice and why is it so important during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our president-elect, or State America's president-elect Terry Drain had spoken about this and had given a bunch of strategies and, and spoke very uh, highly on this topic. So thank you, Terry, for your, for your words and, and inspiration. So Anyone that knows these answers, please type in the chat box and Sean and I are looking for them and we will find out who won. Sean, what do you got so far? Keeping up with who's been chatting in the chat box, <laughs> who's been typing in. <laughs> Always bring Michelle Huff. We got people. We got people. There we go. Okay. Yeah. People are chiming in now. Uh, let's see here. Tom, our Tom Lowry has said one as well. No, I don't think that was earlier. <laughs> Brad Brummel has got one. Sean? Yeah. What do you think? I'm going to let you call it. You let me call it? Yeah, I'm gonna let I'm you looking call at it. my notes here. I'll let I'll, I will let you call it. How about that? I'm gonna hit this mute button. We can do rock paper scissors to the screen, right? <laughs> oh, come on now. Um, I am gonna have to go with our very own Brad Rumble for improving teacher instruction. Yeah. yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Brad, do it again, <laughs> sir. Congratulations, Never Brad. Congratulations, Mr. Brummel. <laughs> Brad, if you said Michelle Huff, it was all rigged, man, so you better be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michelle's won, I think, two of them now. <laughs> Last time I was really on won. at the Minnesota uh, convention, guys told me I couldn't play. I know. <laughs> Oh, dang. Which, 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 was part of the game. <laughs> That's not very inclusive, guy. <laughs> There's a reason behind it. Our dynamic duo was one of the answers, so we couldn't participate. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brad, we will send you a Heart Zone watch. Uh, if you send Guy your information, I'm sure that he probably already, already has it. But if you would send him your information, please, that would be amazing. And it will be sent to you as soon as possible. So I have, moving- I have that information. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Tom. Um, so moving on right along in our next question, and this is gonna go to a little bit about our professional development and continuing education. And um, part of Zagging 101 was the family that had happened and that formed from 
turning off the screen at the end of Zagging 101. And there's so many of you on the screen right now that took part in our weekly discussions. And that is where so much, I mean, I say so much magic happened. It was so much inspiration, insights. People were able to be themselves and people were able to share just how to become better as, as in the HP profession and what are, what are we, what are some of the problems that are arising and how can we be part of the solution and just so much advocacy happened in, in that. So uh, because of that, you know, we will be having a Zag talk, which Guy had spoke of in Minnesota Shape Convent, the keynote, and that will be another opportunity for us to continue that conversation and it will be spotlighted all those different topics that we had talked about in Zagging 101 and more because as we continue to pivot and shift, you know, these topics are going to continue to be, uh, are going to continue to pivot and we have to make sure that we stay relevant as we all try to zag all day, every day. And another piece of this is the Zag Academy, which leads into this question, which is kind of um, how this question came about. So um, this question goes out to everyone and it is talking about how does the importance of providing professional development and continuing education opportunities serve as advocacy for health and for leaders and administrators as our profession continues to evolve? Well, first, because I've got my supervisor hat on and I know Brett's going to be right behind me. <laughs> um, you know, the phrase we've been hearing through the pandemic is everybody's a first year teacher. The phrase we've been hearing is with the onset of so much technology and the need to be able to be, you know, digitally literate, people are starting to shut down, et cetera. I think you just, just like with kids, you've got to meet teachers where they are and make sure you don't have to push them so far so that they don't burn out. Um, you know, obviously Zoom fatigue is real and digital wellness is very important, but at the same time, it's important that, you know, as a profession ourselves, we put our best foot forward, but for the, the teachers who are struggling, we've got to teach them a growth mindset first. And then we've got to show them, here's what's available to you, right? Um, we all scrambled, as many teachers scrambled and grabbed at the first thing they saw because they were so desperate to find material and information around the way they should be teaching. I mean, take, it, take a high school teacher, for example, that has been teaching basketball and volleyball for 30 years, right? Let's say that that's, that's the case you put a virtual classroom in front of them and you put a pandemic in front of them and what are you expecting them to do? We're expecting them to say, look, be calm, take a deep breath, everything's gonna be okay, we've got your back and the baby steps that you can take is on behalf of your children. And so if I was a supervisor working in the schools actively right now, I'd be saying the learning curve is real and be patient with teachers who are struggling and be humble about what it is we don't know and make those small steps happen. Um, there's gotta be a lot of patience here. And, and if I was evaluating teachers on their ability to have that growth, the most important thing I'd be evaluating is their ability to be flexible and responsive. That's for sure. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing that Brett wants to go next because he's, he's been offering PD to, to his teachers. Go ahead. Well, and matter of fact, I just did professional development for my teachers this week. And, and what I ended up doing though this week is going to them for the PD. And uh, I actually had them, several of them videotape themselves with some best practices that they're doing. But before we got into that, I, I had one slide. And the, the last thing on the slide is take things one step at a time. Don't burn yourself out. And I said, you know where your point is. If you are still stuck on your Google Meet, because that's what we use in our district, and can't do anything more, tech, then don't do anything more. I said. Do not feel that pressure because I'm showing you how to use a Pear Deck today, that you have to use that. So we've got to take it one step at a time and we just got to keep supporting our teachers. And that's the thing about it is all across the country, we got people doing all sorts of different things. We're completely virtual. The uh, district down the road is hybrid and we got other districts nearby that are full time. You know, it's all over the place. Everybody's got their different levels. The morale in some places is pretty low. And we've got, to, we've got to recognize that and support those teachers. And, and I'm very clear, I'm, I'm very careful about the language I use. I say support, because the difference is, if you're helping someone, it means you know better. And you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna take over. When you're supporting them, you're giving them what they need 
uh, and actually listening. So it's really important during this time that we have to support our teachers and our, uh, all the professionals who work in this field with us. And, um, and part of it is just being, as we were talking earlier about listening, you got to listen to what they have to say and, and what their needs are. And the other thing I'll add to that is, is here's a very important thing for each of us to hold as some accountability. And it's to remember that our state associations and our national associations are a nonprofit. And for far too long, one of the things that's held us back is if people don't go to convention, they don't pay for membership. And we've got to continue to spread that message that we are your messenger. We are your advocate. We are on your side. We are doing things behind the scenes 365 days a year. And so we've got to continue to lift up membership because one of the things that's been good about COVID is that a lot of people are looking to us in new ways. But then there's also this expectation around everything is free and accessible. And at the end of the day, that's not going to help us fulfill our mission of what we need to do to continue to elevate health and PE. So that's one of the things that we've got to continue to do as state leaders and people in this profession is continue to support our state associations and our national association by encouraging more membership so that we continue to offer quality programming services and a lot of other things. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Brett. <clears throat> Thank you, Judy, for that. Um, you know, kind of pushing the conversation forward real quick, though, Anna. Yeah, I can't, I can't just be giving out freebies. I work for the national organization. I start giving out freebies. My email phone be blowing up. So <laughs> I can't just be giving stuff out free like that. So next question, and this one's out to the field again, but Judy, it's, it's something you touched on in just this previous topic, and that's digital wellness. And if there's anything we've learned about COVID-19 and this pandemic is that health, particularly mental health and wellness, is, is, is at the forefront of all of this. And a, and a stat I have here is that depression and anxiety have quadrupled from 80 to 30, excuse me, from 8 to 30 percent in people ages 18 to 35 since this pandemic. And, you know, the, the screen time, you know, physical activity, especially when we're talking about students and families just in their homes, need to be addressed. So I asked the field, how do you practice digital wellness while promoting the importance of mental health um, and wellness via social media? Well, I'll I start. I, I don't practice digital wellness. I'm a nut on social media. I never put my phone down. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Go ahead, Terry. I'll go next. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just like to point out that uh, I knew Judy before she was a boxer. In fact, I, I might have been the one that introduced her to boxer. So, yes. um, yeah, I know we've come a long way. I actually did want to give a shout out to Shape America staff because we have come a long way in the last four or five years. When I first got on the board and Judy was there, um, it was Colin Brooks's first year and Artie Camilla was there. And I think that was the beginning of it all. And in that short amount of time, look at how we've upped our game. So, Kudos to Shape America staff because you are now leaders, I, I believe, in social media. So thank you all. Uh, speaking for myself, um, I definitely have to budget my time because you is definitely something that all of a sudden you've been on your computer for a couple hours and you haven't got anything else done. So um, I um, sometimes I need to step away. Um, today I wanted to catch up on the Shape America podcast. So I uh, was listening as I walked my dog. So that was great. I knocked off three episodes in that walk. Um, um, also, I might sit on the bike trainer as well. But um, it is, uh, it's all about balance, I think. So that's what I strive, strive to do. That's my solution. I, you know, I joke. I, I'm on the phone a lot. But, you know, I never thought that post Shape America and post my retirement, I'd ever pick up my guitar again. And here I am, since the pandemic hit, just finding a new renewed sense of love for music like I had when I was in high school. And uh, it really brings, it brings my stress level down. And, and at the time Health Moves Minds came about, I never thought the Mindful Minute would be as important to me as it is at this time. And I and my family members practice that regularly. And I never thought that would become part of my regular routine like it was brushing my teeth. So, so I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful, thankful for those skills and and the ability to find something other than staring at the phone because uh, you've got to recognize when it's too much, you know, and you, you definitely have to know when to bring that level of digital use down. It's the truth. But I, I want to jump in too, though, that on the other hand, like, for example, you know, for those of us, unlike Judy, uh, who's, who's retired, uh, 
I'm sitting in front of a computer all day now working remotely and I've, I'm literally almost eight hours on the computer. And um, I, I don't do Twitter as much as I should, but I'm a Facebook person. So at night when I'm, I'm actually decompressing by getting on Twitter, uh, getting on Facebook and doing a little bit of social media just because I can get there. Uh, and anybody who's on my feed knows that I love uh, giving and finding dad jokes, you know, but that's, that's that stress relief that, that goes on there. So sometimes it can be part of the solution. Again, but I also do the same thing that Terry was doing. I, I listen to podcasts when I'm running in the morning um, or biking. And so there, there's different ways of doing it. I'm still getting the, that physical activity as well. Brett, I have to admit, I absolutely love the dad jokes and I always try to bring, you know, throw a gif at you real quick just to let you know I'm paying attention to you. So keep, keep them coming. I, I, I'm paying attention. I'm noticing. All right. So next question, this I'll, guy, I'll actually start with you with this question and then we can kind of open it up to the field. You had mentioned earlier when we got started tonight uh, about the report that you submitted to the board of directors, Moshe board of directors. Um, and in your six month Twitter analytics, what you identified is that social media consumption has decreased 85% since September, basically as schools were opening. Um, and that's particularly for videos over 10 minutes, right? So the other parts of your report shows us now that videos two minutes, two, two minutes and 20 seconds and under get more views now. Um, knowing that, understanding that trend, what strategies, guys, starting with you again, would you recommend to advocate for in topics that are important to our field, such as social emotional learning, the WISC model, health moves minds, content? You know, it, it's, Sean, it's a great question. And it's a very important question for everyone to listen to. I, I know that if you're looking at doing long form videos like YouTubes, I'm not saying that they're not valuable, they are. Uh, but the reality is right now, when we look at consumption, I'll just give you a simple case study. We ran 12 episodes of Zaggy 101. And after our ninth episode or eighth episode, we were into the thousands of replay views. And that, that's an extraordinary number. It, it is out to a national audience. And that was like that way for basically, you know, nine or eight straight weeks. Then we ran the analytics. We go from at our peak, we, were, we got up to 1,800 and some views. And the next three weeks, we couldn't even break 100 replay views. Now, what does that say? Now, if I didn't look at the analytics, we'd keep still doing that. And our shows, by the way, average between about 40 to 55 minutes. And that's a big ask. Let someone sit down for 40 to 55 minutes. And if they're doing that, it's because there's value there. What I'm saying is based on this data, and it wasn't just that data, it was some other data that we looked at. Brad Brummel shared some data with me, and we were seeing this trend. And the reason why I bring it up in the, you know, to answer this question is I then said, well, I know the other thing that is really working well. We did this with Spakerspot, and with Spakerspot, we went from those live streams uh, that were sometimes you know, five to seven, eight minutes, and now they do all their, all their shows under two minutes and 20 seconds. We posted on Twitter and we've been able to get anywhere from 500 to a thousand views on any given week based on what they talk about. So what I'm going to say to, to this, because SEL is so important, the WISC model is so important, and certainly everything related to health moves minds is so important is that we got to think about getting involved in those shorter videos under 220. I also think getting more testimonials and case studies from people that social proof, if you would. I know you guys have heard me teach on that before. That's also going to help. Um, but yeah, I'm just saying right now, there's a pivot. Uh, we know here, I give you three global uh, stats. Number one, uh, more than half of the U.S., excuse me, not U.S., of the world population that are adults are on social media today. Since the pandemic began, most pe or half the people have doubled their social media uh, time on, on social media. Okay. Again, no surprises anywhere. Now, here's where it becomes tricky. This is my fear for our states. If you're not up on all this analytics, if you're not up on all the strategy, here's the, here's the hardest thing we're facing today. Attention is oxygen. How are you going to get your message to cut through? We've got so many people out there. The question is, how are you going to cut through the clutter? That's what I'm saying to this group today. Guys, we've got to wake up and realize that it's going to be tougher to get our messaging out there. Why? Because consumption patterns have changed. Is this my opinion? No. I'm studying the analytics. I'm studying the data. I'm talking to other states. So you see the same things. 
if you look at North Carolina, if you look at us, if you look at um, you know, Jamie's pedal pep talks, you know, his are all in our, you know, three minutes. Our videos are now under, you know, two minutes and 20 seconds. We're seeing those things work. All I'm saying is we have to be mindful of our strategy moving forward, because if we think we can just do like we did this summer, where like in our case, we were putting out content 40 to 55 minutes. It's just not getting seen. It's just not getting watched. And in case you're wondering, the world average uh, time on, on YouTube is 11 minutes and 22 seconds. So if you're thinking about doing professional development, I know that Laura Beckman's group, who does a lot of professional development with Missouri Healthy Schools, they've taken that, they've cut all that time into half because we know that people don't have it. And the other thing I think what Shape America did, kudos to you guys, the podcast, like Brett said, like Cherry said, hey, we can listen to that while we're exercising, walking dogs. It's another medium of which we can be multitasking and still getting the quality content we want. So we're, that's why Tom said, Lowry said, we're looking to pivot. We've got to figure this thing out because we want to be ahead of the curve and definitely not behind it. For sure. And Guy, you said something really important as we talk about advocacy. It's testimonials. It's yep. sharing those success stories. And, you know, if I, we want to take it to the, the Shape America podcast. We had Darion Cockrell from Lindbergh Schools, who's the Missouri Teacher of the Year, on, to, on our show. You know, we have to share those success stories and those testimonials for, to be recognized you know, statewide, nationwide. So thank you on that one. Anybody Sean, else Sean, with that? Sean, hang on, really quick on that. I want to, I just want to show one other thing on power. Guys, I'm going to show this with you. That was a stat I've been dying to tell you guys, and I forgot. When we ran the statistics on all of, um, I did this for Shape America, and I did this for us. In the last few years, the most shared content and engaged content is anything related to people winning like Lifetime Achievement Award win winners, or teachers of the year. Teachers of the year are our greatest ambassadors. Why? Because people just want to know about how they did or what they did. They want to hear their story. It's a fantastic platform for all of those people in all our states to hear their stories. Again, looking at the analytics, that's where we see the most engagement. The other thing is, in our case, with, Darryl, with uh, Darian Cockrell winning of all teachers, regardless of profession or field, when he won for PE, this guy has already generated from his story over 200,000 engagements and impressions off his story alone. That's the power of advocacy. We're using our own people who get these opportunities. And yeah, that's another way that we can advocate strongly for our profession. So we're going to extend this question just a little bit longer. And I want to uh, uh, toss it over to Jamie Sparks. Jamie, you know, what would you recommend when it comes to advocating for those important topics in our field? Well, I mean, part of this, the, the and to be clear, for those that are newer to your social media platforms or maybe not as much video experience, that two minutes and 20 minutes, that two minutes and 20 seconds is critical because that's what'll fit on Twitter without having to link. So anything, if you go longer than that, you got to have a link to YouTube or a, a Dropbox or something like that. So a two minutes and 20 seconds, you can upload that directly from your phone. And so that's gonna play as people stream through. So that is kind of a sweet spot that, that we've discovered as well. And mostly uh, some of it was organic, some of it was listened to Zagging 101. Um, there, there's been a couple of different things um, that we've done. The pedal pep talks, I know it's the, I, everybody that knows me knows that I'm not good at being short with my words. And so I learned in pedal pep talks to, to shorten those up a little bit and be more concise and start doing better notes. Um, and that was sort of my navigation through, through the, as we were beginning of COVID, uh, but also just kind of our way of just staying connected and putting positive messages out there in the world. Um, the other thing that, that on a personal level is this summer when masks were start, just starting to be the conversation, I just did a quick analogy between a mask and a seatbelt and posted that when kayaking came back and it had all kinds of shares and views on Twitter and Facebook. And so I started to realize that two minutes and 20 seconds was really a sweet spot um, that people were going to, was going to get a lot more reach. And then, so the next place we used that with Kentucky Shape, that uh, thinking and understanding was around Backyard Advocacy Day in July. So we did a video that we, we did a lot of other longer videos that we were preparing to help teachers around professional development. But we took that and to promote online advocacy day and did an advocacy video around PE 
if done correctly, if using Shape America's recommendations, can be the safest. But we knew to make it less than two minutes and 20 seconds. And we had a, a lot of success with views and shares and, and that. And then so this week when we did Kindness Across the Commonwealth, two of our promo videos, we made sure that we connect, I connected those videos down to that under two minutes and 20 seconds. And so there is a lot of success, especially if you want to. Now, there's always going to be a time where you need to do longer content. But as far as, um, you know, promoting stuff and doing some sneak peeks, um, you get a lot of success from that. And same thing with your messages for your students, you know, the opportunity for them to sit down. But if you want to get some messages and follow up, that, that's kind of a sweet spot. So um, that's worked very well. Kindness across the Commonwealth, Sean. I'm, I'm here to tell you, man, it's been huge in Kentucky. And Tom, I know you, I know you guys claimed the first tattoo, but it's <laughs> looking very strongly like Kentucky's going to claim the second and third one. I'm just going to tell you that, all right? It's not Ooh. over till it's over, Jamie. <laughs> Tell them we are the sh we are the show me state. We go to the end. Let's go. Right. Hey, we got we got the Super Bowl champs in our state now. Come on. All right. So uh, let's see here. <laughs> you had to throw that one in. You had to throw that in there, Jamie. <laughs> right. So, but you know, to our teachers that are listening, if you took anything, you know, from that part of the conversation, you know, when you're talking about guy and his zagging. Jamie and his pedal talks and you know me with the podcast advocacy starts small and starts small and grows you know you have to continue to do it to get better so start advocating now and you will become better in time especially when it definitely matters so let's Anna, you and I we have a special guest in our crowd today um Wait, we have a zag bomb we no. got a zag bomb zag we got bomb. We, we've got a special guest in, in the audience today coming to us from Shape America, Chief Executive Officer, the Stephanie Morris. Stephanie, how are you? I'm good. Hey, Sean. Hey, everybody. <laughs> nice to see so many awesome, friendly faces, really from across the country, which is amazing. Go Mo Shape. You should be really proud. It's good to be here. We got some people up late tonight, so appreciate yes. all those. No matter what time zone you're from, we appreciate <laughs> you being on. Stephanie, how are you feeling about this session? What are your thoughts so far? So many good points covered. I feel like we're really firing people up to go out there and be strong advocates on social media, right? I think there's a lot of uh, great food for thought going on. I love watching the comment box too. I think yeah, TikTok, why not, Stephanie? I think um, every platform, with every platform, really, there's an opportunity to be reaching and engaging kids and teachers um, and thinking about how we get our advocacy message across and share information and resources. So I get to throw out the next question, right, Anna? Absolutely. You have a question for our wonderful panelists tonight. I do. All right. This is for everybody. Uh, and it's a really good one. Um, so thank you, Moshe, for giving it to me. Uh, but because of the prominence of social media, right, all the things we've been talking about, that there, there is so much out there, and it's such a huge communication stream for us as Americans. Really, around the world, it's a huge communication stream today. So the question is, do you think leaders in the future will be required to have more of a presence on social media in order to lead? And I think we're specifically obviously referring to our leaders within the HPE community, but I think that's a very interesting thought. So throwing it out there, what do you think? I'll start on this one. I, I, there, I have one problem with that sentence in the questioner, and that's the word required. There's so much more to leadership than just one aspect of what uh, of we're talking about here. And do I think it's probably something that's going to be helpful to any leader? Absolutely. But saying that it required to have more of it, that might end up scaring away some people who I think could be potentially very good leaders in the future. So we have to be real careful about, and I think it's part of what we're talking about today is the language we're using and how we're, we're presenting, presenting this. If I were to say, you gotta be good on social media, you're gonna turn a whole bunch of people off who might actually be really good at this. So uh, I, that could be really good leaders for us. So I think we just have to be real careful about that. Absolutely essential to uh, being effective uh, in the future. I think that's something that needs to be considered uh, but not a requirement. So that would that'd be my one, one caveat there. Yeah, I'll just jump on and, and say, first and foremost, good leaders do what they always do, which is to harness the power of human connection, to build relationships. That's first. You can't be a good leader without that. But it doesn't help to be a leader if no one knows who you are. So yes, absolutely. Get out on those social media platforms and be known and be heard and do your thing and start small 
and advance your network and, you know, build that flock. But, but first and foremost, um, those attributes of being able to fire up by human connection uh, and build relationships. It's what we tell teachers they need to do with kids all the time. And it's no different than if you're a leader. Um, you, know, you know, I left Shape America, I've, I've rolled off the board, what, a year ago? And I'm still all over it. I'm still all over Twitter, supporting what the states are doing. I've, I've barreled back into New Jersey Aford and just uh, embraced my family back in this state in, in major ways. And, and you've got to harness that power of connectedness. It's the reason why kids come to school. It's the reason why we wake up in the morning. And right now, a pandemic has showed us uh, that real leaders have been able to tell us that even though we cannot be together, it doesn't mean that we, we, we're not still together. You know, it, mean, it doesn't mean that we still can't advance our mission, advance our relationships, advance the kinds of things we're trying to do in this profession, right? It, the, the world can't stop. Kids, kids need to be healthy and well. And, and it takes leaders. It takes leaders and it takes us to a place where we've got to be on every platform necessary. I mean, when I was president, I only had one megaphone. It was the megaphone in person. Now look at leaders. They have Instagram. They have Twitter. They've got TikTok. They've got, you know, Snapchat. They got all kinds of things, right? And, you know, you can't be the master of them all, but you certainly can put your voice out there. And, and it's important, right, to, to cross posts so that you can you know, take on the entire community. If there's 200,000 physical education and health people out there, they represent every child. And a leader knows that our class is 50 million children. All right, I want to jump in there too. Well, first of all, well said, Judy. Brett, I, I was getting ready to say exactly the same thing. And uh, the other point I'd just like to make is you have to be intentional with what you're doing on social media. Where are you leading people to? Just because someone has 40,000, 50,000 followers doesn't make them a leader. So identify what you stand for and how are you are gonna advance the mission of Shape America and the profession and use social media as, as your amplifier. So, you know, it's a tool, but just as more important than the tool is the message. They go hand in hand. So again, be very, very intentional with what you stand for and what you're going to push out there in social media. Uh, and I'd say that's the impact we see happening on the national level right now. And I think it's probably true at the state level. But if you think about that, your message and what you do saying to being a leader, um, that's, that's the reality of what I've experienced and, and seen a pattern the last four or five years. At one time, when we vote for national people, you'd read a resume, you'd look at a picture, and you'd listen to a video. And a lot of time, that was an abstract process. And a lot of people may or may not have voted as a result of that where now you feel like you know these people, you're connected to them, you've interacted with them, and that's changing the game. And, and I noticed that pattern a few years ago that uh, it's been a while, it's, it's been at least five or six years since anybody was elected to the, to the national board that I've not been connected with on some social media platform. There's been people that have ran. And so while it's not required, it, people are listening, people are responding to that. And so that's the reality of, of where we're at and, and how we use the tools that are at our disposal. And, and, and again, think about this, for those that were on this meeting at the start of it, think about the camaraderie in the community that were in this group, and that's how much more we know each other as a result of all the different ways we connect. And so um, that it, it's, it's here to stay, and COVID has caused us to rely on that aspect even more um, as we move forward. And so um, that's, that's what we've got to continue to learn how to navigate. And along those lines, guys, I agree with everything you've said. And there's no doubt when I was writing the textbook on digital media, I'm going to tell you the, the, the most surprising thing that I learned. I was shocked by it. You know, you could ask organizations or businesses, you could ask them, you know, do you know what makes you different? Do you know what you stand for? Does your organization know what you stand for? And a lot of people could say yes. But when you get guys like me, that are looking at the analytics and looking at what are you actually saying? And we know this because Judy and Jamie, you were there when I did this for Shape America. There were some really interesting discoveries and finds. The same thing happened with our state in Missouri a few years back when we did that. And the other thing that's making it a little more challenging is that we can fix that part of it. But the other part of it that I want to make sure everyone's clear on, these tools aren't staying stagnant. I mean, if, if you've seen like what happened with Facebook, they got the brand new studio. They don't want people going to, to YouTube anymore. They want to create their own YouTube. You look at Instagram, they now have stories. They, they now have a few more added features. So what I'm saying is, is that 
the continuing education in social media is also going to be important as we all move forward so that we can continue to leverage these platforms to Judy's point so we can be very strong every time we want to put on a message. And as far as the required goes, that may not be the right word. And I, and I think that everyone has it right. But I do, I will say this, if we're going to be effective, we've got to leverage these tools to our advantage and not let them play against us because that will, and that will affect our ineffectiveness to lead. Thank you, Guy, for thank you, Guy, for finishing that up. And Stephanie, thank you for the question and being on. Real quick, the word that came up a couple times was connectedness, and that's so important. How many people on here can say they started a new job during this pandemic and they didn't get a chance to meet their bosses yet? Well, that's me. I, I started with shape. I started with shape in August, and you know, I'm here in Missouri. Everybody I work with is on you know the leadership teams on the East Coast. So I haven't physically met my new you know my new boss, my, my new team, my new bosses yet, but because of social media, because of these platforms, town halls, all this, I already feel connected to Stephanie Morris. I already feel connected to Carly Wright, who's on as well. So yes, definitely the importance of connecting this. Anna, I think you have the last question for us. I do have the last question for the night. And I, I, I do, I feel like in, I want to highlight one of the things that I talked about really quick that how we took advantage of this opportunity during COVID. I mean, this one of the reasons why we're here is to tell that story about what we used in social media. And I think I, I applaud our HP community because we saw this as an opportunity in order to advocate for our profession to the future of it. And we used our platform and just connected, like you said, Sean, and with all of these people. I mean, I told Stephanie Morris in the chat before she came on and said, I feel like this is one big family conversation that we're having right now. It's so much fun. And I just, so if any of you are out there right now that are listening and are not yet really connected, get connected on social media with us, uh, you know, shoot us messages, follow us on Twitter and get connected in that conversation because this really is an opportunity in order to continue for the next steps and to pivot um, as the cornerstone of our profession. Mm -hmm. So, um, so thank you again so much. And, but wrapping up tonight's town hall is, you know, on the impact of social media and advocacy is, you know, what is one key strategy or thought that you'd like to share as we contribute, to, uh, we continue to advocate for our HP profession during the COVID-19 pandemic? I'll, I'll jump in right now uh, before someone else takes it. <laughs> um, this is, I learned it, from, learned it from Zagging 101 and it's about, look at that data. Look at that data and one of the best ways you can do that if you're using stuff is use Bitly. So that right now, it, it makes a huge difference. I can track to see how many, uh, how many people have uh, looked at uh, the videos I've created. So look at the data, and if you're just getting started, use Bitly. Some basic stuff right there. Yes, absolutely. Scale on the mic, chat. <laughs> <laughs> we knew it was coming. It was coming at some point, guys. I think you might want to build on that. That goes right into your language there. <laughs> Anybody? I, would say, I would say, make sure to tell your story, the story of yeah. now, right? So yes. each of us are impacting children in such profound ways. And we keep talking about the level of stress and depression and anxiety. We keep talking about um, the, the issues around our country regarding social justice and the fact that every child has a different story and every child has a specific need. And, you know, prepare that elevator speech for the moment when you're going to need it because it's profoundly important, the stories we have to tell in health and physical education. And guess what? For the first time in my entire career, everybody's listening to us. Wellness is important to everyone. And the speaker is on and the microphone is in front of you. So let's do it. Yeah, well, we, we mic drop in here. Anybody else? <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> You know, I'll, I'll add just that personal responsibility for all of us collectively. Uh, don't just see something and just say, oh, that's good. Social media is about an algorithm and you got to interact with that algorithm. And that's where that collective impact comes in. So if you like it, you create a little rock. It's like, right, throwing your rock in the water and it creates a little ripple. If you reply to it, if you share it, if you retweet it, it's a bigger rock. And that's what we've all got to continue to do especially being very strategic through our state association, through our national association. Shape America has a tweet out right now about World Kindness Day. If everybody on this call would retweet that right now, 
Think about how many people tonight are going to see World Kindness Day. That ampl it amplifies, and everybody's got to do their part. So like it, retweet it, reply to it, and let's really lift up World Kindness Day. Right, Michelle Huff? Well, <laughs> we've heard from Brett. Of course, of course, of course. Right. <laughs> there you go. We've heard from Brett, Judy, and Jamie, President-elect Terry Drain. You got something All right. for us? Yeah, absolutely. It's know our why mm. and be able to answer the question, why is physical education important? Why is health education important? Why should we exist? And everything comes from that. Mike dropped. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to the panel. We appreciate that. So, so with that, Terry, I want to I wanna say something that happened last Saturday. Uh, I just want to thank, you know, Tom Roberts and Minnesota Shape for allowing me to be keynote. And especially my topic was on Zag Talk, you know, why other Zig, we Zag. And it struck me as pretty interesting that a state would want to jump into that kind of conversation because it really is a mindset. It's about, hey, while everyone else is doing the Zig, let's be that Zag and let's stand out, cut through the clutter. But I want to say something, Terry, that you taught me this summer when you spoke in Indiana Shape. I actually shared my why of what I do, and it all started with Stephanie Morris back in 2018. I had that screenshot, I told that story, I shared my why, and some future professional put a tweet out about it and thanked me for doing that. And Terry, I wanna thank you for reminding us on that this summer to share a why and do the same thing with our story. And I, I gotta tell you, it was, real, it was just real profound to see a future professional do that and it just really made me feel like, like, wow, you know, like these things, these little things are very important. We know people are watching. So here's my last takeaway. And no, I'm not even going to talk about that analytics. I want to really tell you guys about the, if, if I'm a state leader right now, if you want to start zagging, all that means is you're willing to change directions very quickly. Here's what we got to do. What we did is we started to collaborate with other groups in our state. We partnered with like the Missouri PTA. That's how we came up with Stuck at Home Recess, Stuck at Home Snacks. That's how Spaker Spot was born. And it was an amazing journey to think that we could partner like with Missouri Healthy Schools and that we've been streaming content for over seven straight months of solutions in that area. Now we're actually doing other things with that through Missouri Healthy Schools. But I'm going to tell you right now, it started with our collaborations with our groups and also looking at more people um, that was a big part of it. But the second part of it, it wasn't enough just that we just could collaborate. And this is coming from, from Laura Beckman. Laura taught me this. The collaboration part was great. But then what we started to do is we started to coordinate our media efforts. And that's what Jamie was talking about. That's why I love Jamie's story about the Commonwealth and what they're experiencing right now is because they're coordinating their influencers to really drive this thing like you can't believe. It's so impactful and powerful. And to let you guys know, we were doing that the whole time, whether we had, you know, Mo Health Media, whether we had uh, Spaker Spot, whether we had uh, Tasty Tuesday uh, or the Mo Shape Minute. If we had relevant content that was related to anything related to Shape America, we would work with Joey Martelli. And he would know sometimes when our, he would know when our live broadcasts were going, and he would be retweeting like within five seconds of those things happening. So whenever we were promoting Health Moves Minds, it was the same thing. We're also doing it with other states. Look at Anna and Anna, Anna Jersey, Marcel Huff. I mean, between the two of them, like we don't know tomorrow's National Kindness Day, really? Or World, sorry, World Kindness Day? You know what I'm saying? Like we're collaborating and, and we're coordinating our efforts. And we're, you know, we're doing that with some of our other states like North Carolina and, uh, and we're gonna start to do it with Minnesota. But I, what I'm trying to say is guys, here, here's the two key words for me collaborate, talk to, these, talk, talk to these leaders, find out what the problem is, and then figure out how to solve it. And then when you're going to go ahead and solve it, when you're going to go communicate on social media, coordinate your efforts. Because that has, that has really what's taken us from this average results to the results that people allow me to come in and, and do Zag keynotes. It's, it really is that simple. And Jamie hit the nail on the head. Just imagine if right now, Everyone just went to their phones and just retweeted any post on World Kindness Day. Guys, we'd see something we've never seen. And the last thing I want to remind everyone, and, and Jamie, you can jump in on this because you were the guy, you were, the, you were there. 
a national speak out day. I've never seen this happen. But when we all focused our efforts, we all saw what happened. We were trending nationally on Twitter, a national speak out day. Why? Because so many HPE professionals were tuned into what was going on on Twitter and slamming and retweeting. And Jamie, anything else you want to add to that? Because to me, that is still one of the most extraordinary stories in Shape America history. Oh, well said, uh, Guy. And uh, yeah, it was, it was awesome. And that's that collective impact. And that's, that's the power we all hold. Yep. We continue to influence the direction we want to go. And get ready to do it again this spring. That's it. <laughs> Strong advocacy. As exactly. Stronger to get together and advocacy never stops. From Anna and I, thank you to the panel. We appreciate your, your time tonight. And I will send it back to our master of ceremonies, Dr. Thomas Lowry. Dr. Lowry, send us home. This has been a wonderful evening. Uh, assembled some outstanding talent, outstanding leadership. But we also had so many people engaged that are going to take this and push Jamie's rock up the hill. Uh, we, we can do that. Uh, we're making great progress. And to Judy and Jamie and Brett and uh, Terry, we can't thank you enough for taking your time. But I also have to thank our social media team, Mary Dremeyer, Guy Danhoff, Chris Daly. These people are amazing to work with. We meet every Monday night on Zoom to plan what will happen that month, that week, or that day. And we're, one of our next pivots is to drill down and bring in a whole new tier of influencers. And this is part of what will be a major projection coming up. Also, we have three days left of our Moshe virtual convention. Thanks to Dennis Dochev for setting up our convention, selecting the presentations. Two of our big presentations over the next two days are gonna feature Health Moves Minds. <clears throat> and tomorrow, Shape America's Michelle Carter is gonna be front and center and bring here her expertise to what we have going on. On Saturday morning, Bill Casey, who you remember from the Shape America conventions, talking about what happened at Neuqua Valley in Naperville. We have a number of additional presentations that you can access. Uh, the email will be sent to members tomorrow morning at six o'clock by Mary Dremeyer. All you have to do is click the link and you'll be able to participate. The only other live presentation that we have is our awards ceremony on Sunday at two o'clock. Jamie, you will be present for that. Uh, also, Michelle Carter will be present for that. This is our opportunity to celebrate our association awards, our society awards, <laughs> and also to honor the major of the year from our Missouri institutions for every major that they have in their program. So this is gonna be a fun event. I can't thank Guy enough for helping to design this, for Sean and Anna to coordinate and be a part of this. Folks, we love to be together and we love to move forward. We are always looking at not being satisfied with where we are, but what else we can do and how we can do it. So thank you. This was inspiring to all of us. We hope that you will join with us in the future as we provide more town hall meetings to move Shape America and the Missouri Society of Health and Physical Educators forward in a big hurry. Thanks very much to you all. Tom? Can, yes. I, can I can I make a quick proposal? Because Tom said you're the president. So. <laughs> at six o'clock in the morning, the email goes out to all our members about all our sessions. Yes. I would propose that the people who are on this session tonight, even if they're not Mo Shape members, 
maybe they should be able to receive that so they can be a part of our conference because they're already vested with us. Yes, and the other part of that, Dennis, all of these presentations will be converted to our YouTube channel. Okay. And so all of the events that we have going on, including this particular meeting tonight, will be set up on a YouTube basis. And Guy will make sure that it goes into our library and Mary will focus on that. So keep looking. All you have to do is look at MoShape YouTube and everything will come up that has been done. It's amazing. So good point, Dennis. We, just as we go into other state conventions, whether it's North Carolina, Minnesota, uh, in anywhere that has a state conference, we can go in and look at their material too. We're all stronger together, as Terry says. And we have to make sure that we practice our kindness, our sharing, and our professional zeal. Thank you all. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Anna. Awesome job, y'all.